and welcome to my video. So I am going to be doing a response to Ryan's response to my response. Uh, anyway, but there is one little thing I'd like to clear up. Uh, you called me an anti-vegan and I'd like to just point out that I am not anti-vegan. I do not hate vegans. Vegans are just people. I am anti-veganism. I do not agree with veganism. I've tried veganism for 11 years and it didn't work out for me. So I am against veganism for many different reasons, mainly because I don't think it's nutritionally adequate and it caused me and my family some problems. So just to clarify, I don't hate you guys, okay? Uh, I'm, not, I'm not a hater. But you did point out that I didn't add any studies. So... Let's look at some studies. So I said the science is not settled, and I stand by that. I don't believe the science is settled. If you look at several of these studies, you will notice they are short, and they do not show the benefits of any intervention long term. Even drug interventions have not been shown to be effective long term with IBS. So that to me just says you need to take these studies with a grain of salt. You cannot just say that they help with IBS because we don't know long term. In the short term, yes, they may help with IBS. One big issue with um, the interventions used in a lot of studies is that they are elimination diets. And basically, they're, well, eliminating a lot of foods, and that can cause nutritional deficiencies. And some of the studies do state this fact. So although these interventions may work short term, in the long term, these people may end up with even more problems, and they may still have IBS. And if you just look at this next study, um, they talk about the frustration that patients have with coping with the symptoms. And it says here, no therapy has been shown to alter the long-term natural course of the condition and no gold standard of treatment exists. And according to a lot of different sources, there is no real known cause for IBS. There are some uh, possible causes like muscle contractions in the intestine, uh, nervous system issues, severe infection, early life stress, changes in gut microbiome. Now, I would like to contrast this with what triggers IBS. So I think that's important to distinguish the two things. What triggers IBS is are things like food and stress. So essentially, when you're talking about changing food in order to not trigger IBS, you're, it's like a Band-Aid, right? It's not directed to the cause. And obviously, we don't know the cause, but... I don't think we can eliminate the fact that she went on a vegan diet when these issues started appearing. That's just not something we can ignore. Okay, so let's move on to the FODMAP diet that you recommended. And yes, of course, it's been used for IBS patients in order to uh, ease their symptoms. So I agree with you on that. And it does say here, low FODMAP education is effective for long-term IBS management, enables a nutritionally adequate diet, and is broadly acceptable to patients. But wait, wait, wait. Let's look at the FODMAP diet. Okay. Vegetables. Yep. So those could obviously all be eaten on a vegan diet. No problem. And of course, fruits there. Good selection of fruits. That's not really a problem. You've got some olives up there, which would give some good fats, I guess. All right, but all those things are low in calories. So let's look at the next page here. Dairy, that is lactose-free. Beef, pork, chicken, fish, and eggs. And then you've got soy at the bottom. This is like your calories here. And then, okay, you've got some rice, oats, quinoa, corn, sourdough. Okay, you've got some grains, uh, no gluten, almond milk, rice milk, coconut milk, fruit juices, nuts and seeds. 
So I guess what you're suggesting is to do a vegan version of the FODMAP diet, which is not what the studies were based on at all. So pretty much all those studies are nil. I mean, maybe it'll work, but maybe it won't. We don't know because none of the studies were done on a vegan FODMAP diet and there's no vegan versus non-vegan FODMAP studies to my awareness. So one possibility is that the damage of the mucus layer is a cause of IBS, um, but they don't know. We don't know. We're not doctors. And I don't know that we should be telling people what to do or that some veganized version of a diet that works for IBS is going to work. And in this case, I think she should kind of just listen to her doctor. Okay, let's move on to protein. You said you wanted me to use your words. So here are your words. The Natural Vegan cites a couple vegan dietitians that I've never heard before and are coming up with how much protein vegans really need. They claim vegans need a little more protein because supposedly plant protein isn't as well digested as animal food. Well, I've not heard that before and unfortunately they don't provide any footnotes for us to like kind of check that out. But so I agree with a natural vegan in this case. Uh, plant proteins are not as digestible as animal proteins, and you'll see this in another video I've made as well, but there's two scores called the DIAS and the PDCAAS. And if you look, you'll see whole milk at the top, egg, beef, whey, chicken, and then soy is right up there at the top. And that's one of the reasons I mentioned that she might need her soy. And then it goes down wheat, chickpeas, etc. And if you look at the low FODMAP ones, um, chickpeas are not allowed, peas, I don't know if those are allowed. Um, rice is quite low. I don't think she's allowed rye. And almonds are really down there. So I really wanted to see if she's really getting all that much protein, which I think is way too much, by the way, on a day not of her choosing. So I picked a September 6th, what she ate in a day video. So once all entered into chronometer, out comes the calories and the amount of protein. She got a mere 49 grams of protein. Mere, I say, that's a good amount. That's what Asino O'Neill was getting, for more or less. But it's 15% shy of her goal of 58 grams, her minimum goal, and a far cry from the 84 grams she got on her self-selected day. And then you're talking about how even a natural vegan can't meet her own protein measurements. And yeah, it's hard to meet those measurements on a vegan diet. It just is. And if you look at my other video on vegans taking protein powder, you'll see, I, I believe that all vegans need to take the protein powder just to reach the basic requirements. And there's probably a bunch of other things I could touch on. I'm not going to go over all the things you said in your video, but I will say this, Ryan, I am sorry for choosing this photo that you didn't like. Uh, I didn't really think it was that bad. Don't be so hard on yourself, man. Okay?